And now uh, Tariq Rashid yep. will uh, speak about a gentle introduction to Neural Nectar. Thank you to be here. Fantastic. Thank you very much. Cool. Yeah. <laughs> um, thank you very much for welcoming me. Um, I, before I start, I just want to make sure that you're here for the right reason. So this will be a very gentle, beginner's, very basic introduction to neural networks and how they work. So if, if you think that will bore you or you already know this, I won't be offended if there's an interesting talk <laughs> next door. But if you want to kind of understand from the beginning and have an intuition, then this is uh, hopefully useful to you. Um, thank you to all the organizers. I know there's not many of them and they put on a fantastic event. It's great to be amongst you know, open source people. We, we share and we learn. It's lovely to do that every year. Okay, um, so neural networks, they're, you know, they're always in the news. Everyone is talking about them. They, they seem to be very powerful. What are they? Um, so let's, let's uh, think about that a little bit. What I'll do is I'll, I'll go through trying to understand the mathematics of what happens inside a neural network, but I'll do it by introducing very simple ideas, which are really boring, but I don't want to complicate the maths, and I want to start somewhere simple, and we can build up from there. Um, I'll talk a little bit about how you can make your own neural network with Python yourself. Yes, there are lots of libraries out there, and if you're doing a project, you might want to use them. But if you want to really understand something yourself, you should try and make one yourself. It's not difficult, 10, 15 lines of code. Um, I'm not joking, actually, and it's all on GitHub, so you can see. And it does something useful as well. Um, I will try and do a live demo, um, <laughs> see, see, see if that works. Um, it should be exciting. I'll do that at the end. And if it doesn't work, I'll go home crying. <laughs> cool. All right. Let's start with a let's start with a question. So, I have a daughter. She's um, eight years old. Um, so she's learning things. Um, she's getting good at some things and not so good at other things. And if I say to her, <coughs> "How many people are in that photo?" She can count them quite quickly. She can count the children, count the man. She might even be able to see in the top corner. There is the arm of somebody, so maybe that's an extra person. But if I say to her, can you add these numbers up? Well, she knows how to do addition, but she, she would look at this and think, too much hard work, make a mistake, boring, I don't want to do it. Um, whereas if we ask a computer, you know, when we go home and we you know, load Python, it's easy to do this with Python, or C, or Java, or anything else. But to tr ask a computer to find photos in a photo, identify people in a photo, th that doesn't seem so straightforward. So you can see here there are two maybe different kinds of problems. Uh, some are very kind of deterministic, very mechanical. You know, you turn the cogs and the numbers pop out. Uh, whereas something like this is harder to encode and describe. And what artificial intelligence, it's a word that is, you know, abused a lot. Um, but it, you know, the aim of artificial intelligence is to try and solve problems which we think require a human mind to do. Um, these are s there's nothing magic about machine learning or artificial intelligence. This computer is still you know, wires and ones and zeros, but our approach to solving the problems can be different and interesting, and that's what neural networks um, do. Uh, you know, I've seen in the news, you know, Google got very good at playing Go, and that uses neural networks. Cars are starting to drive themselves, and they they use neural networks as part of their systems. So it's it's you know it's a lot of a uh, hype. So let's 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 try and understand what is happening inside a neural network. What is the mathematics that is happening? And let's start at the very 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 beginning. You know, imagine I want to build a machine that is intelligent. You know, like science fiction, you know, so the HAL 9000 or something. And essentially, you know, in human language, I want to ask it a question and it has to give me an answer. And in doing so, it has to do some thinking. It's a good place to start. But if we replace some of those words with, with terms that are closer to programming, coding, telling computers what to do, we Instead of asking a question, we're actually providing our computers some input, and it is providing output. You'll be familiar with these words. And the thinking, the processing, is essentially calculating, and that, that, that is all computers do. 
And that's all neural networks too. So imagine we have a um, uh, uh, this machine that's artificial intelligence, this this neural network, um, and imagine we have a problem that we want to solve. Now up here, I have a very easy problem. I've chosen a deliberately easy problem so that we not kind of confused by, uh, distracted by it. But uh, I'm going to use it to illustrate a few important points. So imagine we want this machine to learn how to convert kilometers to miles. You know that it's not a difficult thing, but let's pretend it is. Let's pretend we don't know how to do it. And we have to teach it. So we might say, we, we, we guess, we, we invent uh, a model of how we think the two things are related. It might be wrong, and that's an important point to acknowledge. When people do data science, when people create kind of artificial intelligent systems, quite often the models are just our idea of how the world could be working. They might be wrong, they might be right, they might be good enough, and that's okay. Um, so for us, let's start with a very simple one. We, th we think that one is related to the other one by a linear factor, by multiplying by a constant, a number. We think one is the other number times a number. So that's simple enough, but we don't know what that number is. So, so the first guess we've made is we think the two are related by a factor. So let's, let's make a guess. Let's say pick a random number, 0.5. So we, we guess that miles is kilometers times 0.5, and we try it. You know, we, we have we have somebody who can tell us what the truth is, either somebody who's very knowledgeable, or we make observations of nature. We do experimental measurements to understand what is the truth. So we say, okay, um, 100 times 0.5 is 50. Well, it's okay. You know, the correct answer is 62.137, but there is an error. The error is 12. So it's, it's not great, it's not terrible, but this is important because it allows us to understand how far wrong we are. And that's an important concept in machine learning. When we're teaching, when we're training a system, the idea of improving it by understanding how far wrong it is, that's a, that's a key concept. So what do we do if we, if we know we're wrong by 12? We, we've, we're too big by 12. Well, you would reduce that um, parameter, that value of 0.5. So let's try that. Actually, no, we've, um, I did the wrong way around. It's, um, we have to increase it. So now we've got 60 out, and it's closer to the truth, 62 compared to 60. So the error, before we had an error of 12, now we have an error of 2. So that's much better. So what we've done here is exactly how neural networks learn. We provide data, which we know um, is true, we compare the answer they give us, and we use that error to adjust something in the network. We'll go into the details later, but this is the idea of using the error to tweak something, to refine something inside the machine to see if we can get a better answer. Let's try it again. Oh no, we've gone too far, and the error's too big in the other direction. So what we've what we want to do now is we've s we've realised we've gone too far. We'll make the changes a little bit smaller. So instead of 0 0.5, 0 0.6, 0 0.7, too far, let's go back to 0.6 and increase it by a little bit, 0.61. And the error is the smallest one we've got. And you can see that we can keep doing this and arrive at something that's good enough. So yes, this is a very simple, boring example. But the concept is important. It's, it's the fundamental concept in how we train machine learning models. OK, let's, um, let's increase the complexity a little bit. So imagine my daughter now. She's um, gone into the garden. And she's collecting little bugs, um, <laughs> putting them in a jar. So imagine she's picked up some caterpillars and some ladybirds and, you know, you know that caterpillars are long and thin, and ladybirds are short and round, generally. Imagine that we measured them. We had a computer that measures them, a robot or a machine. And if we plotted a graph 
of their widths and their lengths, you would see two clusters. You would see the caterpillars tend to be longer and thinner, and the ladybirds are shorter and wider. So that's a useful thing to, um, to have some insight into. But could we train our very simple machine that we've come that we developed to to determine if a bug that my daughter's picked out of the garden is a caterpillar or, or a ladybird well if we go back to what we've what we developed here we have a, a linear um i don't want to use complicated words it's it we've developed essentially a line that says one thing is related to another one in a linear way and if you plot that that is a, a straight line and this straight line, is, is this a good um, classifier? Well, no, because it doesn't correctly separate those two kinds of uh, insects. Is this um, a good classifier? Well, this one is not good either. It can't tell me whether one insect is a ladybird or a caterpillar. It needs to separate the two types of insect. <coughs> so this one does that. And you can see, if you remember your school maths, that a line y equals ax, if I adjust the a, just like we're doing kilometers equals a times miles, if we adjust the slope, we might be able to train it to learn to recognize these insects. And once we've trained it, you can imagine if you have an unknown bug, well, what is that one? Well, it falls on that side of the line where it's longer and short, thinner, so it's a, it's a caterpillar. So you can see how a simple, simple concept of a linear classifier, a straight line, can be used to identify um, things like <laughs> bugs in the garden. It can be trained to do that. So classifying things into different categories is a little bit like predicting things which we were doing first, kilometers to miles. Let's dig a little deeper. Um, I've brushed over um, and not talked in detail about the learning process. So let's imagine we're learning from data. Again, to keep things simple, I have a data set of two items. <laughs> so not hundreds or thousands, as you should do. The more data you can learn from, the better. But let's just imagine we have a data set where we have just two examples, and we know what they are. We, this is what we're going to learn from. So we have two bugs. One is width three, length one, and the other one is width one, length three. And we know one is a caterpillar and one is a ladybird. We plot them. And we let's go through that same process of training our model, just like we did at the start. We pick a random number to define the slope of this straight line. y equals 0.25x. So it's not very steep. It could have been another number. It's just a random number. Now, we know that this doesn't um, separate the two. We can look at that graph and say we need to shift the line up to make it a good separator. It's not a good separator. We don't have to do any maths to do this. We can just look at it and understand that's what we need to do. We need to shift it up. And if the line shifted up, it would be able to separate those two classes of insects. So what does that mean with the gradient? We need to increase the gradient. It's very familiar. It's what we were doing before with the example with kilometers and miles. So that was the first example that we learned from. We, over here, I've, we found that uh, y equals 0.367 gives us um, a separation. But rather, the other example over there, learning from the second um, item in our data set, our training set, well, all we need to do is to make sure the line falls on this side to keep the two separate. And we can choose something like y is 0.29. We can do that. But there's a problem here. So yes, the good thing is we found lines that separate the two classes. But what we've done effectively is only use the current training example and ignore the last one. So if I looked at that one second, the one at the top, I've drawn the line there, but I might as well not have looked at any other previous example. So there's a problem there. I'll come back to that. I've missed a, a little slide out. So 
I didn't want to put too much mathematics in this, um, but if you remember from school maths, you can define straight lines as y equals gradient times x. And if we need to correct it, if there's an error, we can write the error is what we want it to be minus what it actually is. Rearrange that equation, error, and we can find what the difference, the change in the gradient needs to be. Um, you can do this yourselves afterwards, or you can email me or contact me if this is this is difficult. But most most people do do this at school, and it might be difficult to remember. So what? Do, so we've talked about this problem where what I've the approach I've defined so far kind of works, but it actually ignores all the previous training examples. I'm only ever looking at the very last one. Well, one approach to kind of fixing that is to introduce a learning rate. What it's saying is that instead of enthusiastically jumping to wherever the last the current training example is pointing me, instead of jumping up, you know, change the gradient by f by 0.5 or 0.10, I actually deliberately am less enthusiastic. I say instead of correcting it by 10, I might jump 5. Instead of correcting it by 2, I might jump 1. So I'm, I'm reducing the amount of change in that parameter. I'm moderating it. Some people will call this a learning rate. In fact, you'll, you, the literature, when people talk about neural networks and other machine learning methods, people talk about learning rates. So what, by, by not jumping so enthusiastically, by saying, I need to be there, but I only move a little bit. I need to be there, I only move a little bit. After a time, it means you have move to something that is respecting all the uh, data points that you're learning from, but you're also not being overly influenced by a data point that might be wrong, an outlier, an error. So it's, it's useful for several reasons. So let's try this. In st the same example, but I'm, I'm only going to improve the gradient by half what I should have. And you can see it still works. The first attempt isn't very good, but the second attempt is, a, is, is actually a nice separator. So th this idea of moderating your learning is important, so I'll just say it again. What we're doing is we're learning from data, and the data is telling us how wrong our model is, and it might tell us that we need to change our parameter that, that we're trying to you know, refine by 10 or 5, but instead of doing that, we're deliberately going to say, no, no, let's calm down. Instead of jumping to 10, let's go 5. Instead of jumping to 1, let's go half. And that allows us to learn from more of the data, and it also prevents us from being incorrectly influenced by a data point that we might have measured incorrectly. OK. Um, Let's turn up the complexity a little bit more again. Imagine that we're not dealing with miles and kilometers and insects in the garden, but more complicated uh, things from, from nature, from real life. And some of those things in nature and real life have interesting relationships. So you might say, if it's sunny and the temperature is high, I might be smiling. So there's a link, there's a causal link. And it might be true if they're both true, so it's an and relationship. Or it might be that, actually, if any of those are true, I might be smiling, so it's an or relationship. And you can see how, in nature, you might say, you know, if it's a certain humidity and you know, the, uh, there's a certain amount of oxygen in the air, it might cause rust. Those two things have to be true. So you can see in nature there are effects which are related in a causal way, related to each other, either by things having to be both true or either true. Can we get our simple neural network, well, we haven't got a neural network yet, our simple classifier, our linear classifier, a straight line, to learn these kinds of relationships? If we've done measurements from nature, like at school we measure things, you know, <laughs> with our science experiments, could we teach our linear classifier to understand data which is related in this way? And putting that picture back up that we had at the start, where we had an input 
processing and output, it's okay to have more than one input. That's okay. And actually, th the answer is we can. Um, what I've done here is it's a two dimensional picture because the two dimensions are one variable and the other variable, you know, sunshine and temperature, you know, oxygen and humidity. And you can see that to learn an and, you know, where both have to be true, I have to separate the variables in the you know at the top right. And if it's if it's an or relationship, I can be dividing the, the two classes nearer the bottom left. And that works. You can see now how a linear classifier, a straight line, can learn data which is related in terms of you know, an and or an or, both true or not true. I hope that's clear. Sometimes you have to look at this for a while. If we had more time, I'd talk a little bit more about it. Come and find me afterwards if it's, if it's not clear. Why have I put this up? Because the next problem is difficult. I'm just tracing the history of neural networks, actually. <laughs> so the next problem, you might say, is can we learn XOR data where the outcome is true only if one of the inputs is true, but not both? And that can happen you know, in, in real life. It can happen in electrical circuits. It can happen in, in nature. So can we have a straight line, y equals ax, our linear classifier that we can train, like we did before, to learn this kind of data where I have to separate those two classes, the reds and the greens. Can I draw a line that separates them? It seems you can't. And in history, uh, 60s or 70s, someone wrote a really important paper that described the limitations of this kind of learning. And, and that was very depressing. <laughs> um, and actually, a lot of funding for universities uh, in terms of research into um, learning, machine learning, was, was drying up because there was kind of pessimism around the, the capabilities of linear classifiers, perceptrons. But actually, I'm sure many people had a good idea. How do we get past this? Well, the answer is we can use two lines. And it's important, um, this realization. So those two lines separate those two classes. What does that tell us? It tells us that we need more than one of those classifying units. You can see this journey from a very simple linear classifier to the necessity, the need, to have more than one to deal with more interesting data. Now, neural networks have lots, but I wanted us to go through this to understand why there's a need for more than one. So from one to two, and then maybe more, maybe hundreds. So uh, th the reason I've tortured you with this is so you can understand um, how simple things can learn quite useful uh, problems but why there's a necessity to jump away from one and to have maybe two, three, four units um, learning together. So some problems, are, you know, some, some data can't be described by a linear classifier. You need more. So let's take a break from the mathematics and talk about nature and biology. So at the start, I posed this question about adding numbers and identifying pic people in a picture. And we said that human brains are very good at that kind of problem, but not the other one. So throughout history, you know, scientists, computer scientists, biologists, have really been fascinated by how our brains, animal brains, maybe even plants, how we are so good. Um, we can learn to do some quite sophisticated things. And maybe the answer is to be found by studying our brains and nervous system. Maybe not, we don't know. It's still a mystery, actually. But as we understand more about how the brain and the nervous system works, we may be able to design better machines for solving interesting problems. Maybe. But it is, uh, you know, you can understand why people try to understand the biology and the neurobiology of, of brains. And, and almost all, um, you know, um, animals have um, a basic unit in the nervous system called uh, a neuron which transmits information from one end to the other to another neuron. 
and let's you know look at um, look at some examples from nature. So a bird, a pigeon, um, has a brain which is 0.4 grams. It's tiny, and yet it can do sophisticated things. It can fly. It can learn to fly in wind. It can fly to avoid other birds. It can learn to feed itself. It can learn to fight, reproduce. It can learn to teach itself. That's amazing, given that <laughs> I can't teach this computer to do that. Um, all with 0.4 grams of neurons. So it's doing something different to our traditional approach to programming. A snail has only 11,000 neurons. This laptop has 16 gigabytes of RAM. I can fit a lot more than 11,000 <laughs> neurons in there. Um, and yet that, 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 that snail can do sophisticated things. That little worm, I can't remember the exact species, but there's some links, has 302 neurons. That's trivial you know, for today's computers to replicate, we think. And just in case we think that humans are the peak of the animal kind of kingdom, um, this species of um, um, whale has 37 billion neurons, but humans only have 20 billion. So it's doing something more than humans. <laughs> if it was not using those neurons, it would evolve them away because it's a cost. It's interesting, it makes you think maybe we're not <laughs> the most intelligent things on the planet, maybe. <laughs> Anyway, those neurons, um, so you know, historically people have looked at, what is it that they're doing? Cause clearly they're doing something really well. Well, it turns out that um, um, when they transmit a message, they don't do it automatically. They actually wait until the input signal is big enough before they fire and transmit the message. So those basic units of computation in nature are almost like this dial, I have to turn it up past a threshold for it to turn on and let the messages go through. Maybe our, when we try to make artificial intelligence, maybe we should use that idea. We can learn from nature. Yeah. Why not? We haven't got any better ideas. So if we do that, you know, we can, we can represent this in uh, mathematics with either a step function, we we don't turn on the output until a certain input is reached. But actually in nature, um, things don't work in a hard-edged way. Things are a little bit smoother, and there are mathematical functions which represent that curve as well. Um, a very popular one is called the logistic function. You'll see this a lot in neural networks, and that's the equation for it. In fact, you don't have to use that one. You can use anything that gives that kind of shape. In fact, there are many different functions that people use. But this is a simple one. And the mathematics f that we'll do with it later is very convenient, which is why it's, it's popular. And in nature, you know, we people who cut open animals um, and observe what they, how they are made, have, have seen neurons connected to each other. So maybe when we try to create an artificial intelligence, a machine learning system, maybe we should connect these units together. And we saw the motivation for more than one unit earlier. So finally, a neural network, a network of neurons. And in terms of our picture at the start about inputs, just to update it with this new idea, we have multiple inputs from other computing nodes. We sum the input, we combine the inputs, and then we have a function that says, I'm not going to go until I've had enough of an input to pass a threshold. And it can be step-shaped or it can be S-shaped, a sigmoid shape. <coughs> and we can draw it like this. You know, we, can, we can replicate this in our computers. We can have little nodes that learn. We can pass signals through from one to every other one. And we can make sure that inside those nodes, we have this threshold function. It's called an activation function. So finally, we have a, a <laughs> arrived at this idea of why we have a neural network in this way. Um, so, phew, you can take a little pause there uh, before we uh, carry on. We're running out of time. <laughs> um, okay, I have to go faster. Okay, so let's ask ourselves, cool, we've got, um, we've got um, a network. How is it going to learn? What is learning? Let's think right back to the start 
when we had that very simple example of kilometers to miles, we had a, n a variable, called it A, B, C, that we changed, and that variable was what was learning. It was learning to turn one number into the other one correctly. What's learning here? Is there a variable? Is it the slope of that activation function? We could adjust that, so we could take the same idea of having inputs, working through the outputs, seeing what the error is, and saying, well, it's not quite right. We have to change something in this network. We could change the, 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 the slope of the activation function. Actually, that's not what happened historically. I mean, people have tried it, but the standard practice is to do something else. It's to change the strength of the connection between those nodes called a link weight. So if I have you know, a signal of 10 arriving there and it's pushed forward, I have a weight which says, you know, I increase it, I ampli amplify it, I reduce it, or I keep it the same. And that factor, that variable, and there's lots of them then for all the links, that is actually what we decide is learning. That's what we have to change. So in a neural network, what is learning, what we're refining, is the strength of those connections. I didn't get time to talk about um, this um, earlier, but this model of, of um, connected nodes is actually very resilient. So animal brains, when they take damage, they can still work very well. You have to damage them quite a lot for them to stop working. Um, in fact, neural networks that we develop in software behave like that as well. Um, it doesn't mean you have to damage them. It means you know if you have imperfect input, like um, a recognize a face that isn't quite captured properly by the camera, it can still do a good job. So that's a really nice feature that we should try and replicate. Um, okay, so I'm going to speed up. Oh my God, 10 minutes left. <laughs> um, so we're feeding the signal forward. Say we have um, a signal of 1 and we have a, a, a link weight of 0.9 up there and 0.2. We just multiply 1 by 0.9 and feed it forward. And the same with going down from 1 to 2. You know, 1 times 0.2 is 0.2, and that's what flows down. <coughs> and actually, you can combine. So if we look at the top right, you're combining what comes into that, into that node. That hopefully is obvious. If not, come and talk to me afterwards. But actually, do you know, if I wrote down on a piece of paper what is happening at each node, so if I take the top right one, the input there is input 1 times that weight plus input 2 times that weight, and if I write it down for this one, that's an algebraic kind of expression. I can use letters instead of what I've written there. The reason I'm showing you this is if I have a big network and I write this out, what is, what is happening at each node? I find there's a pattern, <coughs> and the pattern is that I can express what the signals into a node as a matrix multiplication of the weights and the incoming signals. Why is this important? Two reasons. One, it allows me to write it down efficiently. I don't have to write out all the complicated expression for a big network. I can just say, the input in a layer is the weights times the inputs from the previous layer. But more importantly, computers, Python, NumPy, graphics cards, they can accelerate these matrix multiplications. That's why people use um, either things like accelerated libraries or the graphics card to support machine learning, because effectively they're doing lots and lots of this kind of calculation very fast. So that's the connection between neural networks learning and graphics cards, because they can do matrix multiplications very, very fast. It's what they're good at. And you, so you say, OK, if you think back to the example right at the start, where we had um, to, look to find a relationship between um, a um, kilometers and miles, we had an error. Well, if the output, the answer from a neural network is supposed to be, I don't know, five, and instead I get six, that's an error of one. So I understand the error there is one, but what's the error inside? 
because I need to adjust the weights inside the network. I need to know what the error is inside. I thought a lot about this, actually, because none of the textbooks told me. <laughs> um, the, the, the answer is that, um, well, there are different ways we can distribute the error back into a network. Um, you might say we can distribute it equally. We can take an error at the edge, outside edge of a network and just split it into a network. Um, turns out that doesn't work very well. What does work well is splitting it in proportion to the weights. So if that link is three and that's one, if we blame more of the error in that direction and less of it, that allows us a way of back propagating the error. And that's where the term back propagation comes from. So you'll hear back propagation as a way of, mich of neural networks learning is back propagating the error. And just like when we were working forwards, we can work backwards to combine the errors at the internal nodes, just like the, the picture shows. There's some example you can work through if you want to afterwards. And the nice thing is, again, if I write out what's happening, it's, it falls in, I can write it as a matrix multiplication, which is great, because then I can get my computer to do those calculations really quickly. Given that we've got um, not too much time and I want to jump onto the um, a live demo, I won't explain that equation <laughs> other than to say, how do we adjust those weights? Well, the relationship between the output of that network and the weights, the WJKs, each different one, is this horrible equ thing. Well, we're not going to unfold that and invert it to have the weight equals or the change in weight equals. That's horrible. So the approach we take is different. And again, this is a really useful concept, which is useful outside n neural networks as well. When we have a very difficult problem to solve mathematically, um, we can solve it in an approximate way. So imagine you're out in the hills outside Florence at night. <laughs> You can't see where you're going. You can't see. Um, you don't have a map of the entire landscape. That's like saying you don't have a full understanding of that horrible mathematical equation. You have to work yourself to the bottom of these hills, and you have a torch. Well, what you will naturally do is point the torch down, and move where the gradient, the slope, points downwards. You will say that looks going down, then it's going down that way, and eventually you will get to the bottom of those hills. That's, I will use the word, gradient descent. And that idea of taking approximate steps um, is useful when we're dealing with horrible mathematical equations. I'll explain why. So everyone remembers the quadratic equation from school, y equals x squared. Now, in school, we often have to work out what's the minimum. Um, let's take this approach. Let's pretend y equals x squared is really hard. Let's just pretend it is. We found ourselves somewhere, does this work? Somewhere, there you are, on, on, on this landscape. And we have to work out where the minimum is. Well, we can see the gradient is pointing down. So we go from there, move in the direction of the gradient. And if you keep doing that, you'll find that you'll get to the bottom. That's an approximate way of finding the, the minimum of that equation. And if that was a complicated equation, if there's a complicated graph, you can see that it would work. And someone might say, ah, well, what if you end up in a false minimum? There's a real bottom, but there's a false one. That is a danger. And it's worth pointing out that danger because it applies to neural networks as well. Because they're learning in this way, they can end up in a false, false minimum, which is why you have to train your neural network lots of times to make sure that you haven't ended up in a false minimum. So the error, which is a what we want minus what the neural network actually tells us is a horrible equation. And we're never going to solve it you know, analytically with algebra. So instead, we take this approach of saying, how do we minimize the error? How do we move down this, this surface so that the error is the least it could be? And if you think about it, that's what training is. It's minimizing the error. So what shapes this, this surface are the weights. I've only put two here. W and W, there's going to be m tens, hundreds, even thousands. So you can imagine it's a very complicated uh, mathematical surface that we have to go down. That's called gradient descent. 
anyway, I'm being uh, prompted to um, hurry up. So, um, okay, it's okay. We've got 15 minutes. So, um, um, what we end up with, if we um, um, take this idea, we've got the error, which is what we want the desired um, output of a neural network, and what we actually get. And what we want is the slope of this, uh, this error, and we want to go down it. And if you do the mathematics, I haven't done it here, but I can promise you it's not more complicated than school calculus using the chain rule. And we probably remember we did that when we were 15 or 16. And there's a blog if you want to look at it being explained. There's a link there. We end up with a really simple, nice equation. And that is the that equation, which is the slope of that surface, is what we descend. So we use this to improve the weights. So we have a weight in the network, the link weight, and we use the gradient of that error surface to improve it a little bit, we go down it a little bit. And we've still got the learning rate, you know, we don't want to jump too far. Actually, you know, here's another illustration of why we a learning rate is useful. If I take a learning rate that is too big, you can see that if I take a step, I'm going to jump over the minimum and keep jumping over it. I need to reduce the learning rate so I can take smaller and smaller steps, less enthusiastic. That's called overshooting. So if we wanted to make our own neural network, um, you might have um, you know, a class, and you think, well, what does this neural network class, what does it have to do? Um, well, it has to do three things. We have, it has to be initialized, so we describe how many inputs there are, how many outputs there are, how many nodes there are inside. We have to train it, teach it, adjust its internal uh, link weight with examples that we know to be true, and then we can do useful work by querying it. Those are the three things, really, that a neural network does. It's not more complicated than that. And I've on, on GitHub, I've provided some um, the code, which is only 20, 30 lines of code. Um, and you'll be familiar with some of the libraries that are useful. So NumPy for doing the matrix multiplications. Um, SciPy's got some examples of functions like the S-shaped ones, like the sigmoid. It's got other ones as well you can use. So I'm going to take you through a teeny bit of code just to show you that it really is about 20, 30 lines of code. Here's my um, um, function which initializes a neural network. There's a lot on that screen. If you take the comments out, and a lot of this is very similar, so the top says self.i nodes is the number of input nodes I can define. It's got three input nodes, or five, or 10. Um, I can initialize those to a random value, like we did at when we were doing the kilometers to miles example. We said start with a random value, 0.5. We have to give these link weights a random value. And you can choose anything, but actually, those who've done more kind of mathemat mathematics have seen that actually, if you constrain it to say between 0 and 1, then you, you learn better. Um, and what we've done here is actually chosen a normal distribution. But you don't have to be that sophisticated. You can just say randomize between minus 1 and plus 1. And we've chosen here at the bottom the uh, activation function. And this is inside SciPy. It's called XBit, I don't know why, but it's just that one that we showed earlier, which has the S shape. I'll come to training next, and the reason it's, is because it's very similar to querying. So just imagine that our network is trained. What does querying look like? Well, clearly we have to have some inputs to the network. You know, We have to give it a question. And then as we, this example uses two layers of the, of the neural network, we have an input layer and you can see the numpy dot dot, which is the matrix multiplication of the weights with the inputs. And then we apply the activation function, which says if it's not as, you know, the, if it's not big, we're not going to go forward with it. And then we do it again from the middle layer to the output layer. It's as simple as that. It's not more complicated than that. One, two, three, four, five, five or six lines. Inputs, matrix multiplication apply threshold, matrix multiplication, apply threshold, that's your output. It's as simple as that. So anyone who tells you that neural networks are complicated, it's as simple as this. 
I could make it simpler, I'm sure. I'm not an expert coder. But this hopefully shows you that it's not a big, scary thing. Now, training, um, I did this afterwards. Now, that looks more scary, but actually you realize the top half is exactly same, the same code as querying because we're, we're feeding the signal forward to get the output, just like before. But what we're now doing is we're saying we've got the output, we need to work out what the error is, which is here, the code here. And then we're doing those matrix multiplications to, to work out the internal errors. And we're updating those weights with the expression we talked about earlier. That's it. Those three pages is effectively your neural network code. You can find the links to GitHub here. Now, if you give me um, uh, maybe two more minutes, three more minutes, I'll show you this working with a real example where we're doing something really interesting like a neural network to learn to recognize handwritten numbers. So we all write numbers in different ways. And handwriting, I can't sometimes read my own handwriting. You know, Is this a four or is that a nine? It's ambiguous. So it's useful and interesting to teach a neural network to recognize these things. There is actually a data set out there which people um, compare their own ideas with. Um, it's called the MNIST data set. You can find the links. I won't go into too much detail here. I'll have to skip through it. <laughs> but you can download it. And there are you know, the academics write papers, and they say, well, how well did you score? How well did you learn those numbers? And you can take this very simple code and get results that are almost as good as theirs. I have to, to rush through the last few slides a little bit, but I wanted to kind of talk a bit about um, some of the experiments you can do. Um, you can have different sized networks. You can have more nodes inside. And you can see in the top left, I've increased the number of nodes. And the performance of how well it learns those numbers goes up, but then doesn't increase so much. That makes sense. If my brain doesn't have enough capacity to learn, it won't learn very much. So I add more nodes or more capacity. It can then learn more interesting things. But then you get to a point where, actually, it's not going to learn much more. And then all you're doing is wasting computer time. And that's what the top left graph shows. We talked about the learning rate earlier. I banged on about it a few times. You can see the detrimental effect of having a learning rate at the top right that's too high, too low, and it only gets the answer very slowly. You increase the learning rate, it gets there quicker. Turn it up too much, and it overshoots. And you can, you can see that happening there. This one is saying, I've taken the training data, and I'm going to repeat learning on it. I'm going to learn on it twice, three times, four times. It's called epochs. And I've got an anomaly there, and I wanted to keep that in. I didn't want to hide that. Just to remind us all that neural networks, the method of learning is random. We start with a random set of weights, and you can end up in a false minimum. Yeah. So what that funny point there shows is that it got caught in, in, a, in a valley that wasn't the true valley. It was a local valley. So this is just to remind you that if you're doing this yourself, you don't do it once train your network many times because it's a random process you can end up in in a, in a false kind of answer all right let's um let's do um there's links which you can um, um have a look at um there's a blog and there's um a twitter and there's some slides i also have a little book if you want to have a look at that <laughs> and it all works on a raspberry pi so raspberry pis cost about 30 pounds this is a raspberry pi zero which costs about five euros, five dollars, four pounds. All of this works on Raspberry Pi. You don't need expensive computers to do this. So now the live demo. <laughs> I'm going to draw um, a number and I'm, I've trained a network on that, on that handwritten data set and we're gonna see if this network correctly um, classifies the number that we've written. So somebody give me a number, so it's, you can tell I'm not faking it. Any number? Three. Okay. What did you say? I asked me one digit. One digit. <laughs> Three. Okay. It can go wrong. <laughs> I'm going to resize it to uh, the size that it expecting. 
I'll save it. Okay. Previously I did um, a four here. Now I'll, I'll run it. Moment of truth. Network says three. So got that right. <laughs> yeah. I I I was I was rushing a little bit there, but I'm happy to come and talk afterwards. I forgot to say that simple code, that really simple code, on this data set of sixty thousand examples and ten thousand test um, uh, set uh, of a set, it, you can get accuracies of ninety eight percent. And if you're a bit more clever, I guess, and try a few other things like rotating your input, you can get over 98% accuracy with about 20 lines of code. So if you only take one thing away from this, is a feeling for how neural networks work and that they're not that complicated. So don't let anyone confuse you with all kind of jargon. Thank you for listening. Uh, <laughs> uh. Rashid, we have uh, still five minutes for some questions. Just one little question. Uh, does your book explain also something about Jupiter, how to create this kind of... Y yeah, so um, uh, I don't want to sell my book, <laughs> but no, okay, you ask. I'm um, interested. Yeah, so, yeah it, it uh, does. Yeah. I know Jupiter is, uh, is, is this, this kind of shell for publishing yeah. the data over IPython. Yeah. Yeah. So learning yeah. the two stuff together would be nice. Yeah, yeah the book has um, uh, um, uh, from scratch f for Python, so you don't even have to know Python first. So it introduces Python and the notebook for complete beginners if you're interested. But you know what, if um, you don't want to buy the book because I don't want to sell it, if you email me, I'll give it to you for free, PDF. Okay. <laughs> Other question? So if I understood it right, because of the learning rate, the ordering of the samples you feed to the system affects the... Uh, the accuracy, accuracy of yeah. So um, uh, the learning rate is simply um, how much you're going to. So you t you're learning from the data, and the data is saying you need to you need to adjust your variables to be there, or there, or there. You know, five, ten, twenty, whatever it is. Your learning rate is simply saying I'm going to not jump all the way, but part of the way. And we saw in this conversation that was a little rushed several reasons why moderating your corrections is a good thing. Um, it allows you to take account of previous examples. It allows you to ignore um, a, a data that might be very wrong, like an outlier. So an outlier might say, you need to jump all the way over there. I'll say, I, I jump a little bit. So you're not so affected by it. And we saw when I put the picture of the x squared um, graph that if in trying to do the gradient descent down the error function, if your learning rate is too big, you'll just keep jumping over the bottom. So when people get more sophisticated with neural networks, they might even say, as the slope gets smaller, my learning rate um, is proportional. That's that's the sophisticated thing you can do. You don't have to. Um, so it's, it's, it's a way of improving your ability to find the minimum of the error. Your other point about the order in which you arrange the training data, um, yes, you know, <laughs> yes, it matters, but actually, this is a random process with lots of data, so you're kind of averaging out. It shouldn't matter too much. Do you see what I mean? Yeah, but like, if I would just have want to have a, a, a neural network that is good enough, yeah, <laughs> I can I can make the learning set, the, the sample set smaller, just maybe by having the same sh sample set, feeding it with different orderings? Or yes, yeah, yep. so the idea of repeating your training set um, is common. Um, so you don't, you can have a, you don't have to have such a big one. And what I've done, what most people do is they don't bother reordering it, they just run it twice or three times or 10 times or 100 times. But your idea of reordering it 
will improve things a little bit. Um, I haven't done the experiments myself or, or read about it, but it makes sense to do that. Yeah. Does that answer the question? Is that okay? Okay. I'm not an expert, by the way. I just do it for fun. <laughs> any any other questions? Oh, there was one there. Yeah, go for it. Um, if <laughs> if <laughs> if you um if you search my name on Amazon, uh, you'll find it. Yeah. Oh, yes, yeah, so we will post the slides, um, the link to the slides, and you'll see the link to GitHub and the blog and Twitter, and you can contact me and I'll give you a free copy. Okay. <laughs> There's one there. Last question. <laughs> Do you have some spare time, maybe tomorrow or on Sunday, to talk more about this. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so tomorrow I'm hoping to explore Florence a little bit. So Sunday morning, come find me. Yeah. If you will if you just search my name on the internet, you'll find my Twitter at Post Enterprise. Just contact me and we'll work out. I will go for a coffee. That'd be nice. Or breakfast or something, that'd be nice. So Actually thank let's you. have breakfast tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> so thank, thank you very much. Thank you very thank much. You. Uh, thank you.